If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter uh, 18. Matthew 18. We're coming now as Jesus is leading his disciples and he's on his way to Jerusalem. And what's pretty amazing about that is that in chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 now, he's getting closer to the cross. So now he's really being a, a spokesman of truth even in a greater way. And the reason for that is because in the first uh, six verses of chapter 18, he's been dealing with humility. According to Nehemiah Rogers, he says, humility is the repentance of true pride. I thought that was good. Because think of all of the pride that there is in a person's life. Many of us here today, we were so proudful. We can't receive from other people. We think we know it all, especially husbands and wives. In that relationship that they have with one another, many times it can create great, great problems in that marriage. And we need to be in submission, or we need to learn to be submitted to the Holy Spirit if we're going to really learn from God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And I think that Jesus, on his way to the cross, as he began to open his heart to them, that now in verses 5 through 10, he's going to be sharing with us that we do not, that we need to be careful not to stumble any Christian. Notice what I said. There are many Christians today that are stumbling a lot of young Christians and non-believers too. What do you mean? By the way we live. By the things that we say. And I think it's really of importance that we understand that according to the scripture, the Bible says that one day we're going to have to give an account of our words. Whatever comes out of your mouth comes from where? The heart, Jesus said. And so we have to really be careful that before we open our mouth, we have to think. And if you're angry, be careful that you don't open your mouth. You wait. So that God can really do a work in your life, in your heart. And as Jesus now sees the cross before him, and he knows that among the twelve, there is one of them that is a betrayer. Judas. He's the one that has been taking care of the money and stealing from the purse every single day. And the Lord doesn't say one word to him. Because the Lord really wants people to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. We all make mistakes. There's none of us in here that are perfect. None of us. We're all imperfect people. We're here by the grace of God. Period. Period. And it's really important that if we're going to become believers and if we're going to go to the next level that God has for each one of us, spiritually speaking, and if you really have a tendency and a heart of growing, then you need to be humble and not proud so you can receive from the Lord. Jesus said, if you ever want to get to the top, you start where? At the bottom. At the bottom. There are people today that are eagerly climbing over people and they don't care if they step over you or not. They don't care if they hurt you. That's not Christianity. That's not the life of Christ. So it's really of importance that we understand as we read the scriptures. Let's begin by reading at verse 5 of chapter 18. I'll read all the way down to verse 10. He says, whoever receives one of this little child... Like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for that person if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Notice what he's saying. Here he begins with a warning, not to the non-believer, he's speaking to the believers. He brings a little child in front of him, in front of the disciples, in front of the crowd. And he says, if you really want to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to be like this little child. You can't have pride. 
Children are very naive. They're learning. Yes, they make a lot of mistakes. They sin a lot too. But it's interesting that as we begin as a little child in the Lord, we begin as children in the Lord, and as we begin to mature in the Lord, there has to be that change of heart and mind and attitude so that God can use my life. There are hundreds and thousands and millions of people in churches today that have never really developed spiritually speaking. They've never have. Paul says they're carnal people, not spiritual people. Three classes of people, the natural men, the carnal men, and the spiritual men. And to become a spiritual man, there has to be true humility in my life and a hunger and a thirst to really know the will of God in my life. Why? Because a humble person helps to build up other people, doesn't tear them down, doesn't defame them. He's building up, not himself, he builds up others. He stands in the background. And it allows people to be built up. He becomes a stepping stone, not a stumbling block. Think what I just said. Think of how many of us are really stepping stones, or are you a stumbling stone? What I mean by that? Well, if you're a stumbling stone, then Jesus wants to talk to you today. Because you're in danger. Great danger. It's really important that we understand that here as Jesus is speaking, that when he was giving the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he was speaking not to the multitudes, but he was speaking to the disciples. And even here as he's speaking in verse 6, he says, But whosoever causes one of these little ones who, who believes in me to sin, and to sin means to make that person that is weaker and you're the stronger and you don't watch yourself when you're drinking or you're partying or watching television or watching movies or whatever you're doing and you're making another person stumble, then you're liable for judgment because you should know better than that. Think of how many parents today allow their children to watch the Disney Channel. You say, the Disney Channel? What's wrong with the Disney Channel? It's bad. It's bad. Teaching young teenagers to kiss and have almost intimate relationships with one another. They don't go that far, but they will sooner or later. When we as Christians, as father and husband and wives, we should be protecting our children. They're the little ones that Jesus is talking about. And if you make any one of my little ones stumble, it would be better for you to put a millstone around your neck and cast yourself into the deepest part of the Sea of Galilee and drown yourself. You're in deep trouble. We should be guarding their minds. There are children today at the age of 12 and 13 years old already experimenting with sex. Experimenting with sex. And it's really of importance that as parents, we need to guard our children. We need to guard them with all of our lives. We need to protect their minds and their hearts. They're going to see enough in this world already without television, without movies that are always promoting evil, always with the second meaning. And if you're really going to follow Jesus Christ, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, just like Paul said in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, 14, he says, apart from holy, he says, apart from what? If you don't have holiness in your life, you will never see God. No one can ever see God apart from holiness. My life has to be holy before God. I need to be what? I need to be aware. I need, I need to be responsible for my actions. I need to be responsible as a Christian. I need to become that stepping stone, not a stumbling block. 
Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, 29, he said this, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into Gehenna, the lake of fire. And then he said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Jesus is going to bring this out again here in chapter 18. It's real important that if you're sinning against God, cut off the sin. He's not literally saying pluck out your eye or cut your right hand or cut your right foot. Why? Because you still have your left and you still have another eye. He's literally saying get rid of sin. In your life. If you want to be used of God. But if you have continually sinned against God. Then God cannot use your life the way he wants to. Plus. You're going to make people go to hell. You're going to stumble them. You go into a restaurant. You order a meal. You order a beer. You think you got the freedom to drink beer. That's cool. I don't have that freedom. I got a freedom to do whatever I want to do, but I don't do those things. Why? Because I want to make sure that as a pastor, I don't stumble people. Number one, I hate beer anyways. <laughs> but you see, it's really important. Why? Because you're in the restaurant. I've been in restaurants, and I've seen people, and they see me coming, and, hi, Pastor Ra, how are you? How are you doing? <laughs> hey, I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not God. Drink it. Get high. Get your rush. I don't care. You don't have to hide nothing from me or anybody else. But something inside brings guilt into our lives. And think about how many things are making people stumble that we do, that we say, and yet we're not aware of it. And the Holy Spirit is saying, wake up. When are you going to get it? I've been trying to talk to you. I've been trying to share with you. Paul the Apostle, in the book of Corinthians chapter 12, he uses the eye, the hand, the foot to illustrate the mutual dependence of the members of the body of Christ. How God says there's a head, which is who? Christ himself. And we become the fingers, we become the toes, we become the ears, we become the eyes, the nose, the mouth. We become one part of the body of Christ. And many times, a lot of times, we don't like to become a toe that is always in darkness. And it smells. We don't like that. If, it, if God made you a toe, you got to be a toe. You cut off my right toe, and guess what happens? I can't walk correctly. I lose my balance. In the Old Testament, in battles... Because they would shoot the bow and the arrow. You know what they would do to the warriors? They would cut off their right thumbs and their left thumbs. So they couldn't hold the bow or pull back on it. You become useless. You become crippled. And isn't that what sin does? It cripples our lives. Think of how many crippled people in the body of Christ because of their selfishness and not awareness of the Holy Spirit speaking to them, they become useless instead of useful in the body of Christ. And some of you are sitting here today. You know why? Because you don't know how to die to yourself. When Jesus was speaking to the disciples, as we studied already in Matthew 16, in verse 24, 25, and 26, Jesus, on his way to the cross, they were up in Caesarea Philippi, close to Syria, close to Mount Hermon, before he goes up. And he says, okay, you guys, you guys really want to be my disciples? He said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And then he said this, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He says, and for what profit is it to a man or a woman if they gain the whole world and lose their own souls? Or what will a man or a woman give in exchange for their soul? What is the thing that you sold out to? Drugs? Alcohol? Sex? Money? Power? Pride? 
Those things will cause you to stumble many people. Paul the Apostle in the book of Romans chapter 14, he says that if, if you think, because the problem was going on in Corinth and in Rome, where people would go to the marketplace and I would buy a steak, and the steak had been offered to an idol, so I would go home, and if I had my conscience for conscience sake by myself, I could cook it, I could eat it, and no problem. And if I had a party and invited people over, and we're sitting there with the steak, and they say, well, where did you buy the steak? Oh, I bought it down at the grocery store, you know, where they go down to the temple and worship idols. They, you know, they offer them to idols, and then they bring them and sell them. We bought it from them. They go, oh, oh I can't eat that. You see? But an idol is nothing because then if that brother is mature but he's not an infant in Christ, then what do I do? That I don't give them those things that are offered to idols. If they're mature, then we can all eat peaceably. You have to be careful how you walk, how you talk, the things that you share with people, what you eat, what you drink. Because you may have the freedom, and I tell people, if you have the freedom to drink a beer, to do whatever, do it at home. Do it in the privacy of your home. If you do it at a restaurant, if you do it publicly, you never know what weak Christian is watching you, and you're going to make them stumble, and God will hold you responsible. Paul teaches that. We need to be careful of our freedoms. Just because you're free, that other person is not free. And this is what Jesus here is trying to teach. Remember the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, 6, and 7, when he's speaking about true, true attitudes. He calls them the Beatitudes. The multitude of people left, and he kept all 12 of them. One of them, a devil, Judas, a betrayer, thief, taking from the purse. And he begins by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. He starts out with the notice with the negative, and now he goes to the positive. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall go out, be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted, notice, for not being weird, but for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not for being weird. For righteousness sake that you're being persecuted. Why? Because people see the holiness of God in your life. And then they torment you. Or they prosecute you. That's when you are blessed. And yet think of the times that you and I and many, many Christians stumble other Christians that are just infants in the Lord. By the things that we say, the things that we do. This is why Jesus is so strict here when he's talking to them. Check this out. In verse 7 now, he begins observation number 1. He gives another warning. He says, Woe to the world because of all the offenses that they have. And the word offense here means stumbling. All the stumbling blocks. Think about that. And what does he say? For stumbling offenses must come. But check this out. But woe to that person by whom the offense comes. Wow. Underline that. You notice the warning now? Jesus says, I know that people sin. I know that people make mistakes. But woe to that person that makes the mistakes and what? And, and stumbles another person and kicks them out of the kingdom of God. Wow. That's not good. Keeping people out of God's kingdom by the things that you do. Woe to you. Woe to you. He's going to use the word woe three times here in, this, in his next verses. And what's interesting, the word woe here means to curse literally. Cursed be you. He says, cursed be the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But cursed be that man by whom the offenses come. See the warning? He's telling you to be careful in your marriage. Be careful with your children, what they see, what they watch. Where you take them to places. Making sure that people that are weak do not see you doing something that is going to shrink their growth in Christ. 
or set them back or even push them away from Christ because then we're in deep trouble. So Jesus here is warning. And the problem here is that he's talking to the disciples because the disciples were so interested in greatness concerning the kingdom of God. Lord, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Who cares? Who's the greatest? The greatest is the one that takes the lowest place. The servant of all becomes the greatest of all. It's not stepping over people and pushing down people, demeaning people, and promoting yourself. Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. The Bible says it comes from the Lord. He puts up one and he takes on the other. I love that. I'm not in competition with anybody. When God's done with me, he'll be done with me. When he's done with you, he'll be done with you. And think of how many people are trying to capture and hold on to those positions where God has placed them and it's gone to their heads and they don't want to let go of that position. And the Lord says, you don't want to let go that I'm going to have to use force. And what does God do? He breaks you. Chuck always say, blessed are the, bro- blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be broken. That's Chuck 1.1. Think about that. But how many of us are not flexible? That we're stiff, stubborn, proudful, when we should be humble. Because here's warning number one. Check this out, warning number two. Verse eight. Look what he says. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Well, if I cut one of my feet or my foot or my hand or pluck out one of my eyes, I still have the other. If I pluck both of my eyes, I already have seen, so my mind already has been imprinted by all those images. There's no way of getting out of it. But literally here, he's not saying pluck out your eye, cut your left hand or your right hand or your right foot or your left foot. He's saying get rid of the sin. Get rid of the sin. For you, notice notice what he says, cut off and cast it from you, for it is better for you to enter into life lame and maimed rather than having two hands or two feet and to be cast where? Into everlasting fire. Wow. That's the warning. The lake of fire. Not hell. The lake of fire. People that make other people stumble and they don't get rid of their sin, they end up where? In the lake of fire. God doesn't play games. That's the word of the Lord. That's God's word. Nobody can escape it. Maybe today you're finding yourself in a place where you find yourself stumbling someone at work or in school or in the gym or at the beach, or at the mountains, wherever you may be, your behavior has to be what? Cannot be compromised. You have to be aware of your surroundings. You have to be aware who's with you and who's not with you, and who's around you. Because there may be someone sitting there, or standing there, or whatever they're doing, and they watch you do something that you do, not of ignorance, but willfully, and you make them stumble. Woe is you. Woe is you. I think of all the parents and their children infecting your little son or daughter's mind by watching the Disney Channel or other cable stations that are not good for children or taking them to the movies that are not good movies or turning on the radio and listening to music that is not edifying and building up but always tearing down. What are you doing? You're infecting your children's minds. You're destroying them. And one day, they'll rebel. Really important what God says in His Word. We need to be careful so that we don't have a woe in our lives, a curse. Because we're not doing what's right. Observation number 3, verse 9. He says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Cast it from you. 
It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes and to be cast into hell and fire or Gehenna. Many years ago, I was doing a demonstration in Kung Fu in East LA for a movie. My brother and I, and we were doing a stick routine, except we weren't using the flexible sticks. We were using oak. And we were fighting with the sticks, and I went to hit the stick down. He tried to block me, and when he went to block me, the stick broke like glass and went right into his right eye. And he lost his eye right there. That's how God used him to come to the Lord. And I felt guilty for a long time about what happened. It was an accident. But it was interesting that when he lost his eye, he never really had any pain in his eye. I mean, if you go like this, your eye hurts. The oak was so sharp when it went in that it plucked out his eye, but he never lost the movement in his socket and, and the nerves. He has a fake eye now, and his glass eye you know, goes all over the place. He doesn't stand still when he's looking this way. It goes this way. <laughs> now I can kid about it. <laughs> I call him Hawkeye. That's what I call him. <laughs> but things happen. And it's interesting because as I began to read the passage, I thought, you know, I mean, it doesn't really matter. He still has his other eye. And what's happened, his other eye has adjusted to driving, to doing, reading, everything else. So Jesus is not literally saying, okay, go pluck your eye, cut your hand, cut your foot. No, he's getting rid of the sin. The problem and the issue is what? Sin, not body parts. Sin separates us from God. And that's why it's really of importance for every one of us that are sitting here today. Too much is given, much more is required. The more you sit in this church and the more you hear the book of Matthew and you hear through the Bible and you go through the Bible, the greater the judgment will be in your lives. So you have to make a decision, either to obey it or to disobey it. But you can't hang out neutral. It won't work. you got to make up your mind what you're going to do. Like Joshua said, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord no matter what anybody else does. And bringing up your children and bringing up your grandchildren, we need to be careful not to make them stumble, but to be witnesses so they can serve and love the Lord and they can do good for the Lord. Just like these young guys up here playing worship music today, they're being trained. One day they'll be pastors. They'll be out doing what God called them to do. And it's really important that we understand that God has not only a purpose for my life, He has a purpose for every one of us here today. And the more you want to be used of God, the more demands He will make to you, not legalism, because we're saved by the grace of God, but too much is given, much more is required. The Bible says that. And that's why Jesus brought up the little child and said, you guys, this is what I want you to be humble, honest, holy, and do what's right. Obey my word. Check this out, verse 10. Take heed, notice, that you do not despise one of these little ones. Notice again, God's protection in God's awareness of true believers. Make sure you take heed, be aware that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels are always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Wow. God is fully aware and his angels are fully aware. Of who? Of little children. God's little children in the kingdom of God. He wants them to grow, he wants them to develop, and he wants them to be great in the kingdom of God by becoming the servant of all. Humility, not pride. Father, I pray in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for this morning. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would lead us, would guide us in a powerful way as we continue, Father, to see the parable next week of the lost sheep. And Lord God, we pray for any person here today, young, old, male, female. Father, that homosexuality, lesbianism, fornication, adultery, lying, cheating, 
not loving people, it's sin. And that the only way to be right with you, Father, is through repentance. It's to get rid of the sin. To get rid of the problem. And so, Lord, this morning we pray for anybody here that has never, ever received Jesus Christ into their hearts. If you're here today, you can leave the same way you came here with all of your sins, all your problems, on your way to hell, and eventually when you die, you'll be there. Or you can change the course of your destiny today. Number one, by admitting that you have sinned against God, you were born in sin. Number two, you can repent, and you can confess your sins to Him, and by faith you can come to Him, and He'll receive you, and He'll cleanse you and wash you by His blood from all of your sins. And then He'll come into your heart, and He'll dwell in your heart, and He'll give you the assurance that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven. 